How does an old school Windows game do multiplayer? There's a million and one ways you can implement a networking protocol. However, I wanted to see how one of my childhood favorites, Worms 2, did it under the hood. Networking protocols are notoriously tricky to unpick, especially when you don't have a live capture of a real server. So I have time boxes to see how much we can figure out. First things first is to get my tooling set up. I've got the game open in Ghidra so I can get an approximation of the original source code. Some of it better than others. I've got the game running under a debugger, in this case x64 debug, so I can inspect and pause the game as it's running. And I've got Wireshark running so I can view the network traffic as it's happening. Let's start. Looking at the networking menu, I can register a custom server, which I've done, pointed it at localhost and given it port 17001 for no other reason than it's just one above the official port. So if I press connect, we can see a packet fly out. I also spun up a simple Python server which will listen on this port. Um, at the moment it doesn't do anything, but we can kind of expand that in the future to respond to the packets that we see, if we see any. So trying to connect, we can see that it does make a connection to our little server, which is good, and a packet is sent. So at a quick glance, we can see a few interesting things. We can see our name that we provided in the menu option in the packet. We can also see this run of 417 bytes, uh, which is interesting because the game was developed by a company called Team 17. So I wonder if 17, 17, 17, 17 is some sort of magic bytes that they put in that all packets are expected to have. So the only other variable that I can seem to control on the UI of the game is this flag. So in fact, if I select a different one and then try and connect, I can see on the next packet that this byte here is changing. So this suggests that the flag ID is encoded in one byte. So that's at least one byte that we can control. However, we can't just stare at these bytes and try and divine some meaning from them. We need to actually now step into the code. So I've set breakpoints on the various Windows networking send functions. However, none of them seem to be called. This breaks my understanding of networking. No WinSock or DPlayX functions are being called, yet a packet is still being sent. So I found a send function in Ghidra, and then I found an actual worms tooth function which calls that. So I've set a breakpoint on that, which is actually hit. And then following that down further, we can see that we end up at the send function in ws232.dll, obviously. So looking at the arguments to the send function, we can see that the number of bytes being sent is 0x5a. So what's interesting is that the first two bytes of the packet are 0x58 and then 0 02. So what I think is happening is that there's a two byte header the first byte is the size of the packet, and the second byte, probably some sort of ID, and then that size doesn't include the size of the header. So we're going to send two bytes, and then OX58 bytes, which totals OX5A bytes. So walking up the stack a bit, we can see the packet gets built using this function, which just copies chunks of data in. That's all very well, but we need to figure out how to respond. This is much harder as we have nothing to analyze. We can see the bytes going out, but we have no idea what bytes it's expecting back in. So the first step is to find the code reading the response. From there, we can hope to try and figure out what bytes it's expecting. In a repeat of the earlier misery, none of the functions that I would expect to read data are actually hit. However, after doing the Ghidra x64 debug dance again, I found that it's using WSA rec v. Thanks. So I'm going to try just sending a load of A's at it, with my hope being that if I just obnoxiously shout A at it, that it'll either crash or display an error, and then that will give me a thread to pull on to try and figure out what data it's expecting. So when I try and connect, I will, I will get my message out. So it just hangs, which makes it much harder to track down. So let's use our assumption about the 2 byte header and craft a message which meets this requirement. So I've I've gone for a six byte message with the message ID A and then six A's. So let's see what happens when we try and send that. <laughs> so I get an error this time, unable to create new player. So this gives us a thread to pull off. So I've tracked down where the string in that message box is loaded from and it comes from this function. So it does a bunch of stuff, then it calls this function and if the result is non-zero, then it displays the error message box. So presumably this needs to return zero for whatever packet it received to be considered a success. Now this function definitely doesn't return zero. In fact, it returns 887700F0. So looking into that 
function call itself, we can see here that at several points it returns these large integers. So I'll assume these are some sort of error code. So, and this particular error code is coming from here. And this code is an infinite loop with a timeout. So we can see here that what it does is it keeps, it keeps looping. Um, and then at the beginning, it takes a time. And then at the end, it takes the time again. And if the difference between those two is greater than 2000, so 2000 milliseconds, then it returns this error code. So, so what this code is doing is continuously trying to do something and for two seconds, not being able to do it and then returning an error code. Now the function being timed is very interesting. It takes two arguments, not that Ghidra has shown me that for some reason, it's only showing me the second one, but it's taking uh, an offset into some buffer and a fixed integer. Now looking inside this function, we can see that it takes eight bytes into that first argument and compares that against the fixed integer. I've put a breakpoint on this check to see if I can trigger it because I want to see what is being compared against that fixed integer. However, I cannot get this to trigger so I'm thinking that I'm failing some other check prior to this. Maybe the message isn't long enough or it doesn't have that special OX 17, 17, 17, 17 bytes in the right place. Either way, the bytes that I'm sending are not enough to get it to this check. It's a bit of a stab in the dark, but I'm gonna try just sending the first packet we received back because at the very least, that's a legit message on the way out and it could very well be a legit message on the way back in. So I'm just gonna read the bytes that I know it's sending me and then I'm just gonna send them straight back. So amazingly, sending back the same packet we received did trigger this breakpoint and it has stopped at this comparison. And I can see that it's comparing against that fixed 259, the bytes 258. So I've stared at this a bit and when the light bulb came on, it was both illuminating and frustrating. So 258, the value that has been compared against is fixed 259, just happens to be the first two bytes of the message we were sent. And if you convert those to hexadecimal, then 258 is 600 and 259 is 601. So I think I just got really unlucky in that the first message I just happened to look at had the length as the first byte of the message. What I think is actually happening is that the first four bytes are the ID of the message and that a lot of responses will be just one plus the ID that it received. So let's put that to the test. So I've taken the data that we've received, which starts with OX58, OX2, and I've changed the first byte to 59, which is what that check is expecting. So now that we've broken again, I can see that it's comparing 259 against 259. So what this function is doing is checking that the first four bytes are that fixed 259 in, um, integer, i.e. 601. So I'm pretty sure that the first four bytes are in fact the message ID. So let's now continue and see what happens. So success, we're at the create room screen. So we've actually managed to progress beyond the first button into the next area. So I did notice that we did get another message as we loaded this menu. Um, it's tiny and it doesn't look like any of the other messages. It hasn't got that OX 17, 17, 17, 17 magic in. So for the moment, I'm just gonna send that back uh, just so we can progress. Okay, so let's now try creating a room. So we did get another message, which we can see on Wireshark, which contains my IP address or my local IP address and the room name I put in. It also starts with uh, 02BC, which is in decimal is 700. So this, uh, again, it sounds like another message ID. So what I'm gonna try doing is incrementing it by one and sending it back and seeing what happens. So I guess another two mystery messages, one of which is the same as the mystery one I got before. So I'm wondering if that is to do with maybe getting the list of existing room names. That makes sense, right? Because when you get into this menu, it will want to populate this table with all the existing rooms. And then when you create a room, it might, make, it might want to try and refresh that list. So I can get to the next screen, but again, error. Um, unknown error has occurred. Uh, connection to server was lost. So there was a slight bug in my server code in that it was dropping the connection after it processed all the messages that it knew about. So it's now set up to just echo back any extra messages. However, nothing works. I can click the buttons and I can type in text, but I get no response. Um, so not only does it not work, it doesn't actually send any more network data. So it doesn't crash and it doesn't hang. It's just devoid of any response to input. This was all starting to look a bit grim. So I went back to see if I could make sense of that message that I'd received twice. So we need to figure out a response to this. It's just sending the same message back doesn't have any effect. So that function which takes a fixed integer and compares the first four bytes, i.e. the message ID against it, is called loads of times with various different IDs. 
So what I've done is I've set a breakpoint on all of these and then run through to see if we can find effectively the handler for the response for our mystery message. So I've hit the breakpoint and then looking back at Ghidra, I can see that it's expecting a response head of OX15F. However, the message we have sent is very small. So I tried just modifying the first four bytes to be that ID, but it didn't progress. So I'm thinking that although it's sending me a small message, it's expecting something quite different in response. Um, what's also interesting is in this loop, which also has that sort of timer paradigm that we've seen before, um, it's expecting a 15F and then also in a loop 15E. So I'm wondering if maybe it, if this is for like the room, the room list, maybe it sends a request out saying, hey, I want the room list and then it reads the names uh, one by one. So I'm a bit of a loss at what to do again. So kind of grasping at straws, I'm just going to take that first valid message that we got, the one with the 17, 17, 17, 17 and contains our name and just modify it to be uh, the ID that we're expecting, OX1F and 1FE. I'm just going to send that back and see what happens. Okay, so I now actually have some data in that list of rooms. Uh, so I was right, that message we were receiving was some sort of request to get a list of existing rooms. And the name is the name that I gave the game when I first wanted to join. So basically what was what I think there is is definitely like a fixed section for string data in those messages. And because I just copied that first message, it's found whatever string was in that, which was the name that I gave it. However, I was now at a bit of a loss of what to do next. I'd already spent more time on this than I wanted to, and without any more network traffic to analyze, it would take a real concerted effort to dig through all the assembly. I did a bit of a search to see if someone had an old packet capture knocking around, and admittedly, I should have just done this first because it turns out someone's already reversed the whole protocol. Feeling a little deflated, I did check my findings against the reverse protocol, and I was pleased about how close I was. I think the only major difference was I got the list item and list end messages the wrong way around. Looking at all this, it would have taken me months to reverse all this out, especially as each message uses different parts of the buffer to store its data in. So kudos to whoever did all this. But it's not all doom and gloom. It turns out there's an active Worms2 community who not only maintain a great community patch, have also been in contact with the original developers who have agreed to stand up an official server. That's right, if you're interested in playing Worms 2 online, there is currently an official Team 17 server. I'll link the community discord in the description as it has all the details on how to get set up with this. However, the low level fun doesn't end here. This version of Worms 2 I'm using doesn't even have the networking option. So if you want to see how I hacked it to find this hidden menu item, then check out this next video.